So today is Palm Sunday, and it's very it's a very fun kind of day. Frequently, you'll see people waving palms around on Palm Sunday. Maybe you've been part of a procession at your church in the past. Let me grab some palms, I'll show you. So these are palm prongs. They're pieces of leaves. And so people will stand up and they'll shout Hosanna, and they'll, they'll go in a procession reenacting Jesus' procession into Jerusalem. And it's the beginning of Holy Week. And Holy Week ends with Jesus' death on the cross. So sometimes people like to take these palm fronds, which represent entrance into Jerusalem, and they make them into a cross. And I have instructions, so I'll show you how it's done. When I was uh, working as a street minister, I used to have do Palm Sunday on the street, and there was a gentleman who would always turn all the palms into crosses. And he showed me, so let's see if I can, with that memory and with these directions, if I can do it. So you take this, you bend it, you take it down, you put it up, and you turn it, and you turn it again, and you turn it again, and um, you pull it through, I think that one's broken. <laughs> so you take your palm wrong. And let's see, you start like this, you turn it like that, you turn it down like that, you turn it over like that, you flip it through like that, and you bring it around like that, and uh, you just keep, you... That one's broken. I think I'll get it this time. Through the magic of television. <laughs> you didn't even see me. So I hope you will come with your parents today and pick up a palm frond. I will have little directions on making a cross out there too, so see if you have better luck than me. Ooh, let's have a quick prayer. Holy One, we thank you for sending Jesus to us. As we remember his life this week, may we be reminded of how much you love us and how much we learn from Jesus. Amen. This morning's Hebrew scripture reading is from the Psalms, number 118, verses 1 through 2 and 19 through 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord, O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and God has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches, up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. The Gospel reading is from Mark, chapter 11, 1 through 11. When they are approaching Jerusalem, at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, 
Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and find, found the colt tied near a door outside on the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying this colt? They told them that Jesus, what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and sat upon it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. So ends this morning's reading. May God add a blessing of understanding to these words. May the meditations of my mind and my heart be acceptable to you, O oh God, my strength and my redeemer. Palm Sunday. It's a short, hopeful moment on the long trip with Jesus to Calvary. And this year, Lent has seemed longer than ever. It's been a year of Lent. But the palms are so cheerful and we love them. And we love to process. It's always seemed a little odd to me, all this celebration just before Holy Week. In today's Gospel reading from Mark, we find Jesus and his followers heading to Jerusalem for the Passover. This procession into Jerusalem is not the only procession that is happening. At the same time, on the opposite side of the city, Pilate is entering Jerusalem with a military procession. Pilate is the governor, and according to historical Jesus scholar Marcus Ford, during high holidays and Jewish festivals, the Roman authorities would make a big show of military force in Jerusalem. The military was there to keep people in line, just in case there was any trouble, which there frequently was, especially during Passover. But you have to remember that Passover is all about liberation from slavery. It's all about liberation from oppression. And that's dangerous stuff, especially if you're an active oppressor. Jesus' theatrical entrance speaks to two groups of people in two different ways. The crowd who greets him and cheers him along the way, to them he's their king, and he'll save them. To the Romans, his humble procession mounted on a donkey seems to mock the Romans and their authority. In the scene right after his arrival in Jerusalem, Jesus cleanses the temple. He turns the table of the money changers and he threatens the power of the religious authorities. So you can see Jesus is really making waves. He's now a threat to the Romans and to his religious leaders. All beginning with Palm Sunday. In our Bible study this week, Judy mentioned that she always liked how involved the children can get in Palm Sunday, from processing and singing songs. And it's true, Palm Sunday is the event that we can most easily find ourselves among the crowd cheering Jesus as he enters Jerusalem. No longer simple witnesses, we become participants. When I was running a Christian education program, we would dress up our coffee, our coffee hour utility cart 
I, I've seen one similar here at First Congregational. It's a plastic cart that comes to about your waist with a shelf on, you know, on wheels. So I commandeer that cart and I take our hobby horse, the horse's head on a broomstick style, and tie it to the front of the cart. I put donkey ears on the horse's head and then I cover the cart in, you know, uh, tan blankets and pieces of animal costumes from the Christmas nativity play. It was so hokey. Let's just say no one thought that that was a donkey or any kind of animal. I remember one woman, she was an artist, and she was so horrified by how bad the donkey cart looked. Can't we get a real donkey, she'd say. I, maybe I can get you a real donkey next year, or a real donkey costume. And then there were the warriors. You're not going to put a child on that cart, are you? What if they fall out? What if, what would happen to our insurance? Well, since the smallest child was the one slotted to ride in, on the cart, I understood their concern. So I asked a friend and one of our deacons at church to walk beside the cart to protect the child from falling. His name was Tarsis. He was a Rwandan refugee who had been through imprisonment in an unspeakable horrors during the genocide. And he really struggled. He missed his family, his wife and his children. His mission was to be reunited with them, to bring them to here or to live somewhere else with them. And he really struggled with loneliness. But he found some solace at church. He really connected with our minister. He called her mama priest. He was a deacon's deacon. He ran a tight ship. He had very high standards. And when the other deacons would do something, he questioned them. They'd say, yes, I did it. He'd say, well, you better make sure. And he really enjoyed the children. He was a kind of uncle to them. He was tall and handsome, masculine, and always impeccably dressed. I told him that there were people, that some of the people were afraid that our little Jesus would fall off the cart. And could he walk next to the cart just to reassure them that someone was there to protect the child? And he said, don't worry, I am here. If you wanted something to happen at church and you wanted it done right, Tarsis was the person to turn to. I was relieved. We dressed all the children up in fleecy shepherd's vests and headpieces, also uh, from the Christmas play. And some of them were to process with us, and some went ahead, and they took their fleecy vests off and laid them on the ground down the center aisle of church. And backstage, things got a little tense. We were in the narthex waiting for our time to process. And we begin our parade a little timidly. And then some of the plants we had in the audience, my husband Stephen and folks in the choir, would see them starting and shout, Hosanna, and start waving their palms. And once the kids heard this Hosanna and saw the palms, they got excited and they started charging down the aisle. What a motley crew we were. The makeshift donkey cart somehow navigating over the strewn vests the children had put down. The children in various stage of costume, me pushing the cart, keeping an eye on the troublemakers. Tarsis making it clear that if the child would, was to fall, he would catch them. We had nothing to worry about. We get to the front of the church and the minister with levity would interview the children new style. And Tarsis would lift Jesus off of the donkey cart with a flourish and put him down. Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem, Hosanna. And the child who played Jesus would beam because, well, he got to ride on the cart. And it was a two-way street. Tarsis loved the children and they loved him. It's hard to think about those joyful moments. 
the hope that Palm Sunday brings. Because it's just a moment, a momentary pause. For Jesus and his followers, Palm Sunday marks the beginning of the end. The entrance into Jerusalem, into the depths of suffering. The hardest part of our Lenten journey. Betrayal, despair in the garden. Humiliation, torture, and death. For our faithful, beautiful Tarsis, these moments of love and belonging were fleeting. His suffering was intense, and his does not have a happy ending. There is no resurrection. For through his suffering, he turned to alcohol, and he struggled with his addiction. The recovery and rehab models that we have here in the States were not part of his culture, and they weren't really accessible to him. And his death rocked our faith community. His family never made it over. There was no reunification. The community garden he started with so much energy had yet to be harvested. How can so much vibrancy in life be gone so quickly? In my Sunday school mind, and I think for many of us, Palm Sunday seems like a mini Easter, a moment of celebration. But we forget, or perhaps we don't know or fully appreciate that Hosanna means, please save us. Save us now. It's not so much that the crowd is celebrating as they're pleading for help. As I've been thinking about Tarsis this morning and the ways that he suffered, I'm aware of how we all suffer, and we can't alleviate our suffering by sheer willpower. We need God's help. In today's Gospel reading, the people in the crowd, they're suffering. They're living under Roman oppression, and they know or they've heard about these miracles that Jesus has been performing. So when they see Jesus riding into Jerusalem, they think he's come to save them. And he has. But not in the way that they want or expect. The means by which Jesus enters Jerusalem is significant. It's steeped in Hebrew scripture imagery. And for the people on the road, it points to royalty of old and power found in the human realm. Peace will come, prisoners will be free, the strong will return. From Zechariah, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, and the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the warehouse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow, bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His, demand, his dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope, Today I declare that I will restore you double. That is powerful imagery. And I wonder what it must have been like to be in the crowd, even someone just passing by casually, to see Jesus humble riding on a donkey. It must have been quite a high, at last, a king to save us. A very conventional, worldly king that we're familiar with, doing a very worldly kind of saving that we can imagine. But high hopes can lead to great disappointment, sadness, fear, and despair. The people in the crowd must have felt greatly disappointed when their king was arrested, when the religious authorities turned on him. The king who could not even save himself and didn't even seem to try. 
didn't live up to their expectations at all. Disappointment soon turns to resentment, scorn, and hatred. And the crowd that once pleaded with Jesus to please save us now jeers and cries for his execution. There is some debate. Perhaps the crowd that jeers Jesus, that cries out for his crucifixion, is a different crowd from the crowd that said, please save us. I don't know that it matters. But I think it is the same crowd. Because it's so much a part of our human condition. High hopes leading to disappointment, leading to resentment, scorn, and hatred. How often has this happened in our lives? The romantic savior that will bring us ultimate happiness, and we pin our hopes, not appreciating that this is a very human person. And that humanness leads us to bitterness and disappointment when we realize that that can't bring us happiness. And we can become disappointed in God. We want God to fix our problems. Please, God, fix my relationship. Please, please help me earn more money. Please, God, let me make the green light. We conflate our desires with God's saving grace. We need to let go of our will our need to control and our desire to somehow magically command that our wishes, wishes become real. To be truly helped by God, we need to surrender. We need to move from my will to your will. As we hear Jesus pray when he's in agony and distress in the garden, he prays, Abba, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet, yeah, not what I want, what you want. So much during Holy Week shows how Jesus has surrendered to God's will. From his entrance into Jerusalem, right to his death on Calvary. And through it all, God is with Jesus. God is with us in our suffering. It is not our will. It's not a kiss and make it better, magical cure. But God supports us. God carries us through. He walks with us through the suffering, helping us to find new awareness, a deeper compassion for others. And through that suffering, through that new awareness and deeper compassion, we will indeed find new life. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is My Song is Love Unknown, verses 1 and 3, in the Pilgrim Hymnal 169.
you have something you would like the community to pray about or be informed about during joys and concerns, please let me know by Thursday or at the latest Friday morning. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Holy One, creator of all, lover of all creation, today we gather physically separated from each other but connected to one another by your spirit. May we be reminded that you are always near, O oh God of peace. Amen. Um. 